from the nation's capital, this is the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast with your host, Rob Snowett. My name is Rob Snow White, and I've been stuck home for nearly two months now. We haven't been fishing much, and that's not so much due to lockdown, but more of the weather conditions. It's been raining a whole lot here. This may be the first year I haven't caught a shot in 20 plus years. We'll discuss this and more in episode 269, featuring Brett McRae. I first met Brett through the Tidal Potomac Fly Rodder Beer Ties. He's a quiet guy that has a lot to say, and when he talks, you need to listen. And that's just what you're going to do for the next hour or so. We'll learn all about his steelheading the Great Lakes, guiding and living in Wyoming, and his new local waters in the D.C. metro area. We're also going to learn where Brett goes fishing on vacation. We'll get the final answer on how you should orient your intruder hook and the only two dry flies you need during hopper season. Hope you enjoy this podcast. Stay home and stay safe. Brett McRae, is there a celebrity who you've been told you look like for those at home to listen and imagine? Well, Rob, you know, I, I get Matthew McConaughey all the time. Very nice. Um, no, I, I that's uh, that's a lie, Rob. That's the only lie I'll tell on the podcast tonight. That's a, that's a great question. I would say that probably the funniest, I wouldn't say it's like a lookalike, but in terms of attitude at times, I've been compared to Ron Swanson. So um, am, that's the office or Parks and Rec? Uh, Parks and Rec. Okay, see, I've seen neither of those programs. So I understand that Ron Swanson has quite, I don't know, maybe it's one-liners or he, sayings or something. Yeah, he does. I, I'm not a huge uh, Parks and Rec guy either, but he does. The parts that I have seen, he says some pretty funny stuff. All right. I'm He's all, definitely a character. I've got time now. We're currently watching Ozark Season 2. And it is, when I say it's the darkest show I've ever seen, I don't mean the way it's written and, and the plot lines. The, the actual sets are always extremely dark. You know, it's funny. My, I'm, not, I'm not watching Ozark either, but my wife has just picked it up. And so I'll see bits and pieces, you know, coming to bed or something like that or when she's on the couch at night or something. And I would agree with that. Every scene, it's, it seems like it takes place at night. Yeah, and there are um, some fly fishing scenes in the first season. Oh, really? With fly tying. Really? There's, there's a clear cure goo makes a cameo. <laughs> I talk about product placement. Yeah. There you go. But they're gone, right? They, 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 gone. they nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, nailed it for them, I guess. Right. All right, so where are we checking in with you currently today under quarantine? Yeah, great, great question. So I am... Uh, I am actually holed up here in my in my basement here in Delray, in Alexandria, Virginia. For those of you not familiar with the uh, the DC metro area, and I, I just sat down in front of uh, in front of my vice, so I might crank out a few bugs while we chat today. Awesome. Where where are you near in Delray? Actually, we are right down the street from Delray Cafe. That may be new. So I, right, I worked at Cheese Teak for many a year, right after okay. it opened. Yeah, absolutely. So if you just go south on Mount Vernon, about let's call it, I don't know, maybe five, four or five blocks. Okay. That's that's pretty much where we are. So not not far at all. Cheese Teak is like a three minute walk. Nice. There's an Aldi right down there. A nice yep. Aldi. Yep. Great Aldi. Oh, I got a, a got a bunch of nice restaurants. And you're a DC or Maryland person. I I was original. I mean, well, originally from Ohio, of course. I think we'll probably get into that. Yeah. But yes, lived in D.C. proper for for a little while, and then once I got married, my wife and I got you know tired of our little little one bedroom English basement and moved uh, moved out here to to Delray. We've right. been loving it out here since. Now, do you know the history of what Delray used to be? You know, Saint there's. Elmo? I, I don't. I know there's a few signs around that I've read, but of course you're quizzing me now, and, yeah. I, and I don't remember what those different signs say. So south of Four Mile Run, where you have shoppers and Target and all that, used to be the largest train switching depot on the East Coast. You had hundreds of guys that worked there, and they had to be entertained. So where Del Rey is now, it used to be called St. Elmo, was just brothels and saloons, and they were horse tracks and gambling and about as much debauchery as you can imagine. Really? Well, uh, 
I guess times have changed a little bit, but but at least it's still a fun place to be. Maybe not quite as fun as it used to be. Right. I suppose the, the historic four mile run sewage treatment plant. Yep, yep. Uh, run by it a lot with the dog. It's you know the last week or two. There's been a whole. All the ospreys have come back. They've been all over the place down there. I like pigeons. Have you been shad fishing at all? I've not caught a single shad this season. I I, I think I went once the very beginning of March before all this started. The water was up and brown, and the fishing. I think we caught a couple, but it was pretty slow. So, and last yeah. night's rain didn't help after Thursday's three inches. No, no, it didn't help at all. Um, you know, I was on the water all day yesterday and only got only had about 10 minutes of heavy rain and then I was coming home and putting my boat away and I there were all these flashes and I was like what is my wife doing inside and then I realized that she wasn't doing anything that was lightning um and that was right before the right before that rain started last night so it's been a been a rough couple weeks after I mean March overall was was pretty solid April a little cold a little wet but uh hopefully that turns around here for May yeah, it's gonna be in the 30s on Saturday yeah, that's wild. So weird. That's wild. Not not supposed to be happening here on yeah. right, May, so what is it, May 6th. Or, sorry, May 4th. Yeah, it's the Star Wars Day. That's tomorrow, right. May, may the 4th be with you. Yeah, I was going to make some kind of Persian kebabs on the Traeger tomorrow, and now I guess we're making tacos. That's right. You got to. Cinco de Mayo. Yeah. Got All right, to. so let's find out about you. You you grew up in Ohio. And that, is that where you started fishing? It is, yes. Yeah, kind of a... I was actually born in Philly, but moved to Northeast Ohio when I was pretty young, and and really, you know, kind of cut my teeth in fishing there. I was, I was very lucky. Um, still am very lucky for that matter. Growing up, I had family in, in North Central Wyoming and also in, in Southeast Maine. So my summers were spent kind of running around both the mountains and, and, you know, in every dock I could find in Maine. So spent a lot of time on the water since I was, uh, well, I guess before I can remember really. And that's, you know, I, you know, a lot of guys have a story about how they caught the bug. I think I have stories about how my fly fishing progressed, but fishing has always kind of been there from the beginning. Anybody put a rod in your hand first, or they just saw you were the outdoorsy kid and it was something to keep you busy? Uh, that's a, it, definitely the keeping busy part. I think my mother knew pretty early that if she just gave me something to do, I would go do it. So, you know, one favorite when I was too young to go fishing by myself was she'd just give me a shovel. And, and I would just go around and dig holes. Dude, my uh, neighbor, yeah. Rob, his kids came by the other day just walking to the park. And my daughter had been playing with tent spikes for a while. Who knows why? And her <laughs> kids found a tent spike and were entertained for 30 to 40 minutes. Hey, that's perfect. They that's were digging perfect. all the onions out of my yard. Like, this is awesome. <laughs> there you they go. Were you perfectly just... entertained. Meanwhile, my kids just sitting there staring at them because she can't figure out how to entertain herself. That's that's funny. Yeah, it's um it, it, when I was young just give me a shovel and I'm and I'm off to the races, but I I think back to your to your original question my my grandfather is definitely the guy that got me started fly fishing. You know, he's a he's a pretty interesting character himself. His his actually his birthday was on Saturday. He turned 91. Still still going strong, still kicking both he and my grandmother both and my grandfather taught himself to fly fish back in uh in the fifties after he got out of the Navy and with his, uh, I believe his first rod that he had was a steel rod. I don't remember who, who made it started with that. And, and really, you know, was the first guy to put a fly rod in my hand for sure. Probably fishing some little, uh, some little high elevation streams and, you know, in Northwest Wyoming, he would definitely, uh, definitely be the first guy that, uh, that got me started. Did you start fishing in Ohio after you went to Wyoming? Yeah, so you know, always summertime looking for looking for stuff to do. So when we, um, you know, where one of the spots that we lived in Ohio was, you know, about a half mile walk, you know, just kind of down the side of the road to uh, to a river that is near and dear to my heart. That's the Chagrin River. So for those of you not familiar with with Northeast Ohio and the Cleveland suburbs, so the Chagrin River is is pretty much the first larger river you'll hit when you head east from Cleveland. Chagrin's really cool. It's uh, a pretty dynamic fishery with a lot of different uh, a lot of different species in there. But the two that are 
that are most noteworthy from a fly fishing perspective are steelhead. Obviously, you know, steelhead alley, very, very well known and and famous for those those jumbo trouts as we as we call them back home um and also smallmouth bass so at the time when i was growing up there was a dam that prohibited upstream migration of uh of steelhead but above that were were plenty of resident smallmouth so i would walk down the street all the time and i would at the time i would fish i'd fish both a spinning rod and a fly rod i'd, I'd usually bring them both and whether it was a, a yellow sneaky peat or like I forget what these things were called, but it was a a zoom plastic worm. It was like I don't know. It was thing was long, maybe seven eight inches or something like that. And whether it was that on a on a gear rod or the uh, the sneaky peat on the fly rod, hopefully uh, hopefully whenever I went down there, I was putting a hurt on some smallmouth. So did that for a long time and loved it. I mean, smallmouth are still one of my one of my favorite fish to uh, to fish for today. With the dam, are these the size of the lake runs? Or are they going to be a little diminutive because they're not able to access the food in the lake? Yeah, great question. It's, it's uh, it. You bring up a really interesting point that I think uh, somebody smarter than me that knows a heck of a lot more about lake run smallmouth could, could answer and give you probably a whole lot of background on. But depends. So those lake run smallmouth that you're talking about are generally pretty big. You know, because like you mentioned, well, presumably because they can access all the food in the lake. Um, that said, though, there were plenty of resident fish that, you know, at the time, which was, you know, we're talking like late 90s, early 2000s here that were they were pretty good sized as well. I mean, I would say those lake runs were definitely consistently bigger, you know, but especially back at that time period, it seemed like every summer you'd catch a you know, you'd catch a handful of fish in the the four or five pound range, which for a resident river fish is a is a real monster. It's impressive. You know, in those lake runs, I would say, you know, they average maybe anywhere from depending on the year, maybe three to four pounds. Sometimes a little bigger, sometimes a little smaller. You know, certainly the residents weren't consistently that big, but there there were a few diamonds in the rough to be sure. Did you have a home fly shop back then? Yeah, so absolutely. That that home fly shop is is near and dear to my heart. And it was different back then. This fly shop is now gone. Anyone anyone from the area might remember Chagrin River Gillies. So River Gillies was uh was right on the banks of the Chagrin, right below that dam I was telling you about. That that dam was in a little town called Gates Mills and, and was around for uh for a few years and not right when I started fly fishing, but that was more once I, you know, once I got out of elementary school, middle school, and into into high school is when when that shop kind of kicked off. Were there other anglers you used to hang out with? I used to trade lures and stuff at lunch with kids. I was yeah. my crowd. Yeah, that's funny. That's almost like pogs, right? But flies. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, I think probably like you, you know, it's it's interesting, right? When you're a young kid who is who is kind of attracted to to fishing and to the outdoors versus who isn't, right? And and it just draws certain people in and it just doesn't have the same allure for others. So, you know, I had a couple of a couple of buddies that that I was really into fishing with. And and you know, we just had a little crew and would kind of roll around and uh and and get a whole bunch of poison ivy and be covered in, in scratches from all the brambles and brush that we were moving through all the time. But you know, that that group was really fun. Um, you know, I've, I've kind of lost touch with a, with a lot of them, but, but one of them is still, you know, one of my very closest friends today, a guy that, uh, he still lives in Northeast Ohio, uh, named Jimmy Lampros, you know, so, uh, amazing how something like, uh, like fishing can, you know, can create bonds that they really do last a lifetime. So that's how I guess I was inadvertently first introduced to you was the film tour where you guys were roommates and jumping down the stairwell and <laughs> fishing the snow. And when I saw that, because I'd been going to my in-laws, before they were my in-laws, you know, my, my girlfriend's parents, my fiance's parents, uh-huh. and then, not my in-laws, in Ohio for years, but I never actually made the trip up to the Great Lakes to go steelhead fishing until I saw that. Plus, I just saw how big the snowflakes were and that you were fishing in that. It was pretty cool. So how'd that film start? And, and you want to talk about your relationship with Jimmy? Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's, I think so let's first, we'll dig into kind of how that, how that all happened. And you know, that Rob, I'm, I was a young man then I'm not, I'm a not as young man now. So I reserve the right for, uh, you know, for Jimmy or, or R.A. Biotti, the guy that, uh, that made the film to, to correct me here and tell me that, 
Brett, you didn't remember anything at all correctly. Here's here's what I do remember. So, um, you know, R.A., obviously a very, very talented guy, really interesting Really interesting guy. He's been around the world. He's he's done it all when it comes to fly fishing. Just an all around good dude. So I met RA. I believe it was the summer before we made. You know, he came out and and filmed that that part of the film tour, and which eventually became uh, off the grid. So I met RA in Wyoming. So I was uh, I was a fishing guide in Wyoming. Obviously, you know, some phenomenal trout fishing out there. And RA came out to this guest ranch um, with. Uh, you know, with, with, um, some folks and, you know, didn't bring any of his gear. He was just out there on vacation, having fun. And he, he, you know, he went fishing a few days with us, uh, while he was out there and said, Hey, this is, this is kind of cool. I think I'll come back and, and we'll film some stuff. So that all happened. And we did that. And what year was that this? was, that was probably, I think that probably was 2008, Rob, okay. or maybe probably summer of 2008. And then summer 2009, R.A. came back with his gear and uh, and filmed some really cool trout stuff. He filmed a commercial for the outfitter I worked for, um, kind of like a little promo thing to put on the website. And while we were doing that filming, you know, we started uh, started talking about where we were from and so on and so forth. And I mentioned, you know, that I also, in the off-season for Wyoming, I, I guided back home, back in northeast Ohio and northwest Pennsylvania for, uh, for Steelhead. And R.A. said, hey, that's something I've always thought you know, wanted to, wanted to check out. And, and I remember specifically him saying that he really just wanted to film something with big fluffy snowflakes. So I said, well, no problem. You know, we've got the snow belt in Cleveland, um, you know, between Cleveland and Buffalo. So come out in December and we'll make that happen. And that's what he did. (laughs) Where, uh, where this gets a little more interesting. And I think this, there's probably a broader lesson to be learned here is, uh, you know, everybody sees these these shoots and these shorts, uh, I guess, shorts and videos on the film tour or on any DVD. And I think it's uh, it was very eye opening to me to be be kind of on the other end of that. You know, when Ari came out, I remember the day that he came, it poured, it poured rain. It was like middle of December. Usually we're getting snow by that point, but it it dumped on us and everything was completely blown out. And I forget if we filmed over the course of whether it was three days or four days or whatever it was, but it was either the first two or the first three were complete garbage. I mean, us just fishing brown chocolate milk, blown out rivers. And and I felt so bad. I was like, RA, I can't believe, you know, I'm, st- I'm sorry you came all the way out here for this. You know, it's look at the water. It looks like garbage. And I, I you know, there's nothing we could really do about it. I remember we caught one fish in a little tributary of one of the, uh, you know, one of the more well-known rivers in Ohio. And we, you know, I milked that thing for all it was worth. And I thought, cause I thought that might be the only fish we'd, we'd see the whole time. And turns out on the last day, you know, we made a run and we were looking at, you know, looking at all the USGS gauges and, and trying to figure out, you know, what we were going to do. And the gauges were still reading super, super high. The sp- some of the uh, the steelhead tributaries in Pennsylvania just drop and clear a lot faster than than those in Ohio. So we made a run out to uh, to a really well known creek out there. Um, normally pretty uh, pretty busy in terms of anglers out there angling pressure. We showed up in the parking lot and I was expecting the uh, the river to be you know be barely fishable, still pretty high, moving pretty fast and probably brown. And we looked at it and we couldn't believe our eyes. It was it was perfect. It was absolutely perfect. The water was jade green. There was nobody around. And and I think, like, just as we were getting out of the car, you know, thinking back to what Ari wanted with those big, fluffy snowflakes, uh, it started to snow. And that was just uh, just a magical day, you know, just where everything came together. whole bunch of fish around. There'd been a, you know, that fall had been really good. There were a whole lot of fish in the system. A mix of of fresh fish and fish that had been in there a little while longer. You know, just a day. It's cool to have something like that on video. Just a day I'll never forget. Hanging out with Jimmy, hanging out with R.A. and getting back to my friendship with Jimmy. I've known him for a long time. You know, spent a lot, you know, probably more time on the water with Jimmy than I have any anybody else. And I've been really been really fortunate to, to spend a ton of time on the water and you know just to talk about our friendship and you know and, and have ra kind of document that is is something pretty cool and you know i think that'll that'll be something we'll both uh, jimmy and, Ohio and i will have together for uh, for a really long time awesome let's talk about 
the steelhead fishery. If you want to spend a couple of minutes explaining to listeners that may not have listened to my previous podcasts or the one mm-hmm. I did with Dan in the shop. Yeah. Uh, what the fishing's like up there, what people can expect. Yeah, absolutely. So, so it's, um, the, to, to really summarize it, Rob, it, it, it kind of all depends, right? But there's a lot of different seasons within a season up there. But essentially, you know, the first thing I'll get out of the way is depending on where you from, you're from, you may, you may call them steelhead, you may call them lake run rainbows. So, you know, full disclosure, I'm going to refer to them as steelhead, even though some of the purists out there, uh, you know, might say that they're not a true steelhead because they're going to Lake Erie and not the ocean. But essentially, you know, the Great Lakes all over. So not just Ohio, but I mean, New York, Michigan, Pennsylvania, you know, anything that's touching one of the Great Lakes, chances are that those states have a steelhead fishery. So I'm going to talk specifically about the uh, the southern shore of Lake Erie. So everything, you know, again, kind of from Buffalo all the way to uh you know, to just west of Cleveland, which is, you know, commonly known now as, as Steelhead Alley. So all the different states have different stocking programs. So that's the first thing that's that's important is there's not a lot of natural reproduction. It's primarily a man-made fishery, although it does seem like that, you know, that there are more and more wild fish each year. Now, granted, that's that's not a self-sustaining population by any means. You know, those wild fish are, are probably, I wouldn't say victims of circumstance, but uh you know, but champions of circumstance, if you will, where they had a good year where conditions were right, they were able to spawn successfully and reproduce successfully. But it's it's largely a man-made fishery. So, you know, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York stocking hundreds of thousands of smolts into the rivers at different times a year. And the, some of those smolts are specific strains. Some of them are more of a mutt, kind of a combination of all those strains. But the result is, you know, is pretty cool and, and pretty undeniable. It's a phenomenal fishery that lasts anywhere from you know, I'm talking specifically in the tributaries now, but let's call it, you know, mid-October all the way through through the end of April. Um, so it's a pretty long season. A lot of diversity in terms of the watersheds that are available. I mean, everything from bigger rivers that are, you know, with super long, deep runs that might be well-suited to swing flies on a two-handed rod to literally to drainage ditches that, uh, that drop into Lake Erie that still get a run of steelhead, um, which are, <laughs> you know, too small even to fish with a... Uh, you know, with a six foot ultralight spinning rod. So a lot of diversity, a lot of fish, you know, popular fishery, angling pressure definitely going up. Um, but for, for good reason, you know, it's, uh, it's a great place to go. If you, if you really want to catch a big trout, what's the story with the fire coming out of that pipe? on the show? Oh yeah. So you're talking about, um, you're, Rob's talking about one of the, uh, the public parks, um, on the Chagrin, where there used to be another dam. So there used to be two dams on the Chagrin, Rob, and that dam is now gone as well. They've both been blown out by floods. I don't know what the story is behind the pipe. I don't know when that started or who, who lit it or whoever. I also, I can't tell you what happens to that pipe when the Chagrin blows out. I don't know if it get, used to get like completely covered up and the next, oh, yeah, the next guy there in the morning would like light it yeah. once the water dropped. I don't, I don't know. But what I will say is I've seen that pipe six feet out of the water and I've seen it six inches out of the water before. And that thing is always lit. (laughs) So I don't know what the actual story is, but it's like the, uh, the eternal steelhead flame. That's for sure. Is there like a name for that hole? Like the, the flaming pipe hole? (laughs) That would be a great name for it though. No, that we, that was just the, uh, the old Daniels park dam. That's all. Did you ever get to what about Bob's? Yeah. So, uh, so back when I was, you know, I don't know. Well, so Rob, that, uh, that film tour short, that was when we lived in Willoughby. So Willoughby, you know, Ohio is right there and we lived above a bar called Malarkey's. And at the time, what about Bob's was, was right there. So I would get a lot of my guide lunches from there. So I was eating, I was eating what about Bob's seven days a week and whatever the clients didn't eat during the day, I would usually eat for dinner. So, uh, sometimes twice a day. (laughs) Yeah. Any particular flies that you prefer up there? And yeah, again, great. Again, you guys still, I find it weird that'll have a, an egg with like a woolly bugger behind it. Yeah. So, I mean, it, you know, it's a lot of angler preference, Rob. And so it kind of depends what you want to do. So, so the other thing I'll say is that, you know, the steelhead are spending most of their, most of their time in the lake, right? So they're, they're not seeing a lot of flies. Maybe they'll see, uh, somebody trolling a walleye spoon or a crawler harness or something like that. But, 
you know, especially when they first come in the rivers, they're really not picky. So, you know, for those of your listeners that want to go up there and, and really want to do the steelhead thing, you know, as, as far as things to worry about goes, fly selection probably shouldn't be at the top of their list. You know, that said, let's, let's get into it a little bit. So, you know, I love the swing flies, um, you know, for a lot of the rivers in Northeast Ohio, uh, you know, a shorter switch rod, let's say something between like 10 and 11 feet is pretty much perfect. And I, I love to, I love the swing flies. I love to, you know, I love to get, you know, get a grab, have a fish, rip some line off the reel on the eat, something like that. And for swinging flies, I mean, we all, we all have our preferences. I've been on a, been on a hot pink kick for a few years now where, it's literally the only fly I'm tying on. It just shows up well in a bunch of different water conditions. And I, I just like it when you fight a fish and bring it in and it's got a big hot pink, stupid something hanging out of its mouth. But that said is, is hot pink the most productive color? Eh, maybe not, you know, a lot of tans, a lot of coppers, olives, you know, a black and chartreuse combo. And as far as like an actual fly pattern, doesn't matter too much. You know, I used to tie a lot of flies after some of the stuff that, um, that Kevin Feenstra has done so he's tied a lot of cool stuff like a grapefruit leech like an emulator so if those are you know if guys want to look up those patterns you know they should and they should tie them because they work you know i think you've seen a lot of a lot of really development in the uh in the swung fly space especially in the great lakes over the last decade you know as more and more guys have gotten into it don't hear much from senyo anymore you know, I was just about to mention, Greg, that Greg has done, you know, he's developed some, not only some really cool materials, which, uh, you know, a lot of fly shops carry. Anybody that carries hairline will have a, you know, probably have a bunch of Greg stuff. Super cool material. So your your listeners should definitely check it out. You know, and Greg, Greg has been a little quiet lately. lately. I might have to shoot him a text and, uh, and kick the hornet's nest, see what he's doing. But yeah, I mean, Greg tied up, you know, has, has been kind of the most, you know, and deservedly so really one of the best known fly tires from, you know, from Steelhead Alley. So Greg grew up, uh, grew up in Northwest PA, you know, has done it all when it comes to Great Lakes Steelhead. And, you know, I tie a lot of variations of, I think he calls it an AI an artificial intelligence. Yep. Um, and a lot of the stuff that I tie is, is basically a knockoff of one of Feenstra's patterns or, or probably one of Greg's. I'll, I'll be the first one to admit I'm not, not the most creative tire in the world out there. I'll usually see, see something from one tire and something from another one and, and tie up something that, you know, that is a cross between the two. Two things we went over a beer tie years ago is you like a double loop on the back yeah. of the hook and you like your hook facing down. Yeah, absolutely. So I know there's there's an age old debate, right, with with guys that swing flies, whether, you know, whether you want your hook up or your hook down. I, you know, I'm sure there's there's good arguments to be had on both sides, but I'm a hook down guy. I find that that you just hook more fish when they grab when you've got your hook down. You know, makes sense to me, right? I mean, they're almost always going to be grabbing your fly coming up at it unless uh, unless you're doing something funny. So for me, I'm I'm definitely a hook out hook down guy. And to your point about the beer tie a few years ago, the double loops. So I, you know, I tie a lot of, a lot of articulated flies. So I tie a lot of shanks. Um, and what I found was, you know, I'd use some, some heavy fire line or spider wire, you know, some sort of braid, um, usually, you know, 30 pounds, something like that. And I'd tie a single loop and eventually, um, you know, cause I'm stubborn and I don't like to change flies. Eventually those loops would wear out or get super soft. And so I'd find that when my fly was swinging, my hook might be like hanging farther down or, you know, eventually would that loop would just wear out and break or, you know, during the off season, maybe they dry rot or something like that. So I started doubling it up, just tying two loops in there, threading both loops through the eye of the hook and then over the, the stinger hook that I'd be using and just found out that they, they seem to work out a lot better for me. You know, I know a lot of guys now use, well, they use everything under the sun, right? I mean, some folks will use mono, some folks we use, you know, Dacron backing, some folks we use uh, wire. I don't um, like for me, Dacron, it dangles. It, exactly. Too much. Exactly. And I think, you know, that's what I'm, one of the problems that I was trying to solve with the, uh, the double loop of fire line um, was that exact same problem that eventually it gets soft and supple and then your hook dangles. But when you double it up, it, uh, it lasts a little a little longer and hey i'd i'd hate to you know to lose the uh the steelhead of a lifetime because i of something so silly as not wanting to use another six inches of fire line now when you lived that close to steelhead were you willing to go to michigan or new york for steelhead or were you 
complicit with what you had there. Yeah, another another really good question, and it's um, you know being in Ohio, you're lucky to lucky to be able to go do all of it, right? You're within striking distance of some of the Western Michigan stuff, which is which is really cool, and you're you're very well within striking distance of of any of the stuff in New York. You know, I would say this, Rob. Like, you, what's really unique about the Great Lakes is that the fisheries, although they're all steelhead, you know, there's well, there's a phenomenal steelhead fishery in each one of those states, respectively. They're all super different. And I would I would try to travel a little bit, you know, when I when I had time off from guiding, which uh, you know, admittedly I, I wish that I had taken a little more time and done a few of the trips, uh, some of the trips with my buddies that I missed out on, just because I was working. But I would travel, you know, you're chasing water, you're chasing different pushes of fish, and you know, one year Ohio might have a down year, but there might be a run of really big fish up in the Pear Marquette or something like that. And and to get on that is just really, you know, is really cool. And uh, again, I, I can't emphasize this enough that just how drastically different, you know, the fisheries are across the Great Lakes. So if variety is the spice of life, then that's certainly what I was after living, uh, living in Northeast Ohio, but traveling around to fish anywhere I could. What was your fishing mobile back then? Oh, so I, I had a few of them, but I think the one that's the most legendary was probably my Jeep Commander, which was one of the later ones that I had. That Jeep, I can't, I don't even remember all the different things that I did to that poor Jeep. But it, it, it made the trip out to Wyoming and back multiple years. They, it, was a, it was a fly shop on wheels. I mean, I had my, like a, my sumo rod rack in there with... I think those rod racks, I don't obviously don't have it, don't have it anymore, but I think they were supposed to have like, you know, they had like six different compartments for, for six individual rods. And I think if I had less than a dozen rods rigged up at, at any one time, it was a slow season. So that thing was worth its weight in gold. Yeah, that Jeep, I can't tell you how many things times that thing died and I brought it back to life. One of my favorite pictures from that thing was on a on a small trout stream in Wyoming where I, where I was guiding and, and Jimmy and the boys came out to visit and we wanted to access kind of the upper end of this property. We were fishing a private ranch and you had to cross, you had to drive through the river at one point to get up to it. And on the way back, we, we'd had an awesome day and had a lot of fun. And we were like, Hey, do you think we can catch a, catch a fish from the car? So we opened up the sunroof of the Jeep and we had a guy casting out of the sunroof, you know, probably casting like 40, 50 feet of line or something like that. And But we were just a little short of, of where we wanted to put the fly in that particular hole. So instead of instead of getting out and walking, I would just move the Jeep up like another five feet, another five feet up the riffle. I don't remember if we actually caught anything or not, but that uh, that's a pretty fun. A pretty fond memory I have from from that that uh, poor old Jeep commander. Before social media to post those shenanigans. Yeah, exactly. Right the stuff I used to do in my twenties. If we had social media back then, probably wouldn't be able to go to public now. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, there's definitely I, I definitely have some funny pictures from back in the day. But I think you know, like anything else, right? Some of the best moments are the ones you don't have on film, and yeah. and it's probably a good thing. So th <laughs> that Wyoming location was it looked really extremely remote. Yeah, it was. It was. You know, Wyoming in general is pretty, you know, well, it's the least populated state. There's a whole lot of land and and not a whole lot of people, which are, you know, the recipe for, in my opinion, for, for pretty good fishing, no matter what you're fishing for. You know, whether it's trout, whether it's smallmouth, whether it's steelhead, you know, and, and there's different types of people, right? And and one of my favorite things to do, I mean, to this day is is really to get out as far off the grid as I can go to go to a place that people don't know about or people aren't really fishing, you know, and see what's there and learn it, figure it out and, and fish the heck out of it and have a good time. Um, and that that part of Wyoming, you know, everybody's familiar with Jackson, right? And and for good reason, right? There's phenomenal fishing in and around Jackson Hole and the Tetons and over on the Idaho side, bunch of great outfitters there, too. But the rest of Wyoming is is kind of off the map, and that's that's the part of Wyoming where my uh, you know where my family's from, where my mother grew up, and and that's the Wyoming that I was drawn to when I uh, when I went out there and guided for sure. What was your season? Just all summer and then winter in Ohio? Yeah, so you know it was it was pretty much summer out west, right? I mean, we you know we'd start getting busy come June, and you know and go through really heavy through the end of August into September, and you know things would peter out really around October 1st. 
which was which was perfect for me because that was when things start you know steelhead started going back home you know so early october things would kick off there and and really run all the way through until things froze up which you know normally would be you know call it january 1st i mean granted it's hard to find people to uh to pay you to go out at and go fishing in Cleveland in late December when uh, you might be chipping ice off your guides every few casts or, you know, may not be able to see your bobber or something like that just due to a snow squall. Um, so things would, you know, things would slow down, uh, you know, once things got really cold, but the holidays, things would always pick back up with people being home and people having time off. We'd go until things froze up. And then as far as the spring fishery in Ohio went, it pretty much went from ice out to, to right about this time of year, you know, beginning of May. There's still a steel, few steelhead around right now, right? That peak has definitely already happened. I and mean, those most of them are headed back to the lake or already in the lake by now. Your Wyoming fishery, was it Brooks Brown, Rainbow, Cuddies? And yeah. What all, kind of water? Was it kind of looked very willowy, kind of like uh, Spring Creek maybe? Yeah, it was super cool, Rob. I'm I'm glad you asked that question. So the 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 fisheries in Wyoming, we had access to, you know, there's obviously a ton of public land out there and there's also a lot of private land and over the years the outfitter I had worked with, you know, developed some really good relationships with landowners, you know, which were both beneficial for the, you know, for the the outfitting business, right? Just to have water to go fish where there was probably going to be some pretty good fishing. But also for the, you know, for the for the landowners themselves, a lot of them were cattle ranchers, and anybody that knows anything about cattle ranching knows that it's it's not exactly lucrative and it's not exactly easy. So it was a really symbiotic relationship that, you know, that was good for both parties. But depending on where you went on any given day, you could catch anything. You could catch brookies. You could catch rainbows. You could go fish terrestrials for big browns. You could go fish a high elevation stream for cutties. We had it all. I'm sure you know where I'm going with that. By by having it all, we really had all different types of water too. I mean, you know, one day I might be, you know, rowing some clients down the Bighorn in in my drift boat. The next day I might be, you know, guiding a wade trip on a on a stream that's 15 or 20 feet across that has one of the you know one of the best golden stonefly hatches you'll ever see. It 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 was different every day, and I think that's what was so cool about you know about that location. But I would say this, like what, you know, when people think of Western fly fishing, Western trout fishing, I think for a lot of folks, that means a drift boat on a big river. And hey, there's some phenomenal, phenomenal drift boat fisheries out really all over the West, everywhere from New Mexico, all the way up to, you know, all the way up to the Northern border with Canada and, and beyond. Right. But I would say this, like some of the coolest fishing I ever saw, and I still continue to enjoy out there to this day is some of the small walk and raid streams that are just they're just completely overlooked. And again, you know, that might be because they're private and there's no access, right? That might be because they're hard to get to you. It might be a rough road to get there. It might be because they barely show up on a map, you know, and some of those streams, you know, some of those, you know, those, uh, those, those, those hay fields, right. With just a winding stream running right through the middle of it. That, grasshoppers in those fields. Oh my gosh, Rob, you have no idea. You know, some summers video of you guys walking maybe, and there's bugs kicking up everywhere probably you know some summers out there it was it was literally a plague you know you 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 could go along and you'd catch as many grasshoppers as you want in your hands and throw them in the water and you'd literally watch trout compete to go eat that hopper it was it was just wild again just super cool how those <laughs> you know how those fish are just using you know using those hoppers and getting fat in a hurry after a great hopper year just the, you'd see fish putting on, you know, putting on length and weight that was just pretty wild. But when they have a protein source like that, that they can rely on consistently or, you know, consistently over the course of a few months, it's, it's amazing what they're able to do. But yeah, that hopper fishing out there is, especially on a small stream with a lot of cut banks, a lot of grassy banks, something like that, that, you know, that you might come to an S curve or something like that and have two holes that were six feet deep covered in root balls, grass everywhere. Hoppers being blown in every time the breeze, you know, the wind blows. Just, just silly fishing and really, really fun, really fun. Any and also too, like, great for, great for beginners, great for you know, really advanced fly fishermen, everything in between, right? Like, who doesn't love a fat, hungry trout coming up and you know, and smacking a, a big piece of foam on the surface, right? Like, if you don't like that, I don't know what's wrong with you. Plain and simple. Did you have particular? favorite patterns to throw out there and then i also want to lead that into the 
beetle pattern you use to catch that mossy creek brown yeah yeah so favorite patterns out west like favorite terrestrial patterns i mean you know i would say for me it's really simple there's two of them and, and they're not you know they're not exactly they're not exactly secrets anymore right but when you know in my heyday these things were kind of the latest and greatest and you know chernobyl ant's been around for forever right robert well not for forever but for 20, a long time 23 plus years maybe that is yeah it's not been a secret scott sanchez no. i think had it hush hush for Ex- a while exactly exactly and i you know my favorite pattern and this came out kind of after I'd been out there for a few years, but was a chubby Chernobyl, right? Just a, just your same old Chernobyl ant, um, just with a wing, right? Making it a lot easier to see. And the, the chubby was introduced when, uh, when I was guiding out there and, uh, gosh, I, I still, you know, I, I have my buddies will make fun of me for this, but, uh, I, I have hundreds of chubby Chernobyls to this day. I love them. I fish them absolutely everywhere. I think everybody thinks that it's something you need to throw when you're, in Montana and Wyoming, but I fish them all over Maryland, all over Virginia. Really, really effective pattern that just imitates a ton of stuff. My my other favorite, which again was was hot new on the scene, maybe in like my third or fourth year guiding out there, something like that, was uh, was a Morris shopper. Right? It doesn't exactly, and 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 his patterns are first of all, I mean, phenomenal tire, right? Really creative, a lot of a lot of unique patterns out there. A Moorish hopper is pretty hard to beat if you're looking to imitate a grasshopper, right? To be fair to the fish, when they're seeing hundreds of hoppers a day and, and eating them, uh, the first time they see a Moorish hopper, they're sure, certainly not going to uh, gonna know the difference. And uh, a few of them paid, paid the price for that, nice. to be sure. Yeah, yeah. So when you were out there and something broke, I mean, you're not in Cleveland where there's a target two minutes down the road. What would you do for provisions and gear and things yeah so so first thing i got to call out got to call out a couple outfitters out there that uh that should be you know that are just phenomenal in their own right so the first one is is the sports lure in buffalo wyoming you know i'm sure that very few folks have have heard of buffalo small town i right around i want to say around five thousand people i might be wrong there so so pretty small town but the sports lure is one of the best outdoor shops i've ever seen anywhere so the guys in the sports lure would always take care of, you know, take care of me, take care of the other guides, take care of our outfitter with anything we needed. So they were, they were Johnny on the spot, whether it came to, you needed a new line for your client rods or just a bunch of bugs because you, you might've had a few too many drinks the night before. And when you should have been tying flies or, or even something like Tippet or a new pair of shoes, um, they had everything. So check them out. The sports lure, they're awesome. Also, the outfitter I worked for, you know, at the time was just a guide service, but now has now has gotten a lot bigger than that. Um, and now is a, a full service fly shop about, you know, 40 miles north of there in a town called Sheridan, Wyoming. It's fly shop of the bighorns. So, you know, another another great business to check out. But we were really lucky, Rob, because you're right, when you're when you're in a remote area, it's hard to it's just hard <laughs> in general, right? You might have to drive uh Instead of popping next door to Target here in Northern Virginia, you know, you might have to drive 45 minutes to go go to a grocery store, right? But those, you know, those shops and, and a lot of the folks running them really, really kept us going um, with what we needed to, you know, in a business that, hey, as you know, you know, you're a guide yourself. I mean, you know how demanding customers can be on gear when they're using it day in, day out. So, you know, those those folks there kept us going. People always question why I have so many scratches on the bottom of my reels. <laughs> have you seen where I fish? People just put the rods down or drop them. Exactly, exactly, right? I mean, no, no question about it. I mean, I can't, you know, whether it's beat up reels or, or rods that are that are missing half the cork, just not because anything went bad, went you know, went wrong with the rod, but just because it's been cast a million times. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're using gear every day, it uh, eventually you're going to wear it out, no matter what the gear is. So it's important to have those, you know, have those local fly shops taking care of you and. and you know, and keeping you, uh, keeping you outfitted with what you need to be successful. So what brought you to DC? As you know, I I would go up to the Chagrin river, go to Chagrin falls. And I talked to Dan. He's like, Oh yeah, you're from Northern Virginia, DC. You got to know Brett. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, Brett. Yeah. So I, 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 he's kind of big. And then eventually we cross paths. I'm like, Oh, you're the guy Dan's been talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I ended up in DC for grad school. I don't know what I what I thought I would be or what I wanted to be or 
if I thought I'd be anything or wanted to be anything, but I, but I came down here for grad school. So I got a master's in, in U S foreign policy, which, uh, was a, was a hot thing. I guess, well, is always, is always a hot thing, Did right? You go to the but, uh, school? I, I went to American. I went to, uh, went to AU, okay. um, to SIS. So got my master's there and, and then stuck around. So it wasn't, although there's some phenomenal fishing around here, Rob, I did not, I did not come here for the angling opportunities. <laughs> We're just, we were yeah. in Charlottesville over the weekend. We drove down for for bagels and sandwiches, and dude, it, it's worth the drive. I'll give Bell Charlottesville a shout out. Uh, we're like, you know, we just live in the wrong town. It, it felt like being in Asheville, North Carolina, or Fort Collins. Even with it just being empty with COVID, no one being around, it just had a different feel and vibe than just the craziness that's here. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, there's so many. You know, Charlottesville is a really cool town. You know, I will say for a city, I think DC's. You know, the DC area is pretty pretty cool when it comes to cities, right? It's you know a lot of green space, tons of stuff going on. Whether you like food or you like music or you know, honestly, if you like fly fishing, right? Um, you drive two hours in any direction, you could be you know, sight fishing for redfish on the Chesapeake or, or big stripers, or you could be you know casting a, you know a uh, a size four green drake in central Pennsylvania. You could be fishing a game changer for smallmouth. You could be casting a giant, a giant whatever that casts like a wet sock for muskie, right? If you're, you know, if you're looking for diversity, I think, you know, there's a few states that really stand out to me, right? Like Michigan, ton of, ton of fishing diversity there. Pennsylvania, same thing, but also Virginia. You know, I, although I, I guess I, I said I didn't come here for the angling opportunities. I think, you know, if you're willing to put in some effort and learn some stuff, there's a ton to be had around here. It really is, which is which is unique. A lot of places don't have that. So let's talk about that Mossy Creek Brown, which may be one of yeah. the most impressive brown trout I've ever seen pulled out of Virginia. Yeah, yeah. And so we'll post a picture. That may be the the icon image we use for for iTunes. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, Mossy Creek's a, a a a small spring creek, kind of in. I wouldn't say really like call it like west central virginia you know in the in the greater kind of shenandoah valley down through there and it's it's a spring creek right so super super weed covered there's a lot of aquatic vegetation in there which which is fun and what that does is it just creates a million places for for big fish to live and big fish to hide and big fish to ambush whatever they want to eat so mossy you know, can get really, I wouldn't say really low because it is a spring creek, so its flows are relatively stable, but it can get really clear, right? And and I don't care where you're fishing, big, big brown trout are harder to catch um, when the water's clear, right? They're, they're smart, they're big for a reason, and they, they don't, they, uh, they don't make mistakes often. So on, on that particular day, and I, I remember this day very well because my then girlfriend, now wife, was really pissed that that me and my buddy were go- my buddy my buddy Stu, who I think maybe you've met him, Rob, uh, maybe at a beer tie or something. But my wife was pissed that we were going fishing. And actually, going back to to bring it full circle with the with the commander, we tried to go out there on a Saturday, and it was raining so hard. And this was the beginning of the end for the commander. I think somehow water got in one of my uh, one of my cylinders and started causing an engine misfire um, so we turned around went back and fished the uh, the Georgetown canal for carp but the next day mossy was up and mossy was super blown out and and muddy which is the best in my opinion one of the best times to go down there and, and try to catch something big so you know I was actually fishing uh, they don't make them anymore but you know, they, well, everybody's making some version of like a jungle series or bass series or predator series rod, but it was one of the original like sage bass rods, the smallmouth, which I would use to throw really heavy, big stuff a lot, whether I was trout fishing or bass fishing. And you know, I was throwing a, uh, just a big, super heavy streamer with, uh, I think I probably, probably added a, you know, a a lead conehead weight in front of it um, and just bouncing it around every undercut bank, every, uh, you know, every weed bed, so on and so forth. And uh, had moved a few really big fish that day. Finally got up to one undercut bank and I swung it under the bank and kind of, you know, popped it a few times and then let it sink. And, and on that sink just got jacked. And that, that was, uh, that picture was the result of, of that morning. Big, big, beautiful. Um, I mean, just, you know, just a specimen of a fish, that's for sure. 
I thought you caught that on some kind of black phone bug that you ended up tying at Whitlow's one night. Oh, that was a different, yeah. So a that was a ridiculously amazing brown trout from Mossy. Yeah, Virginia. that was that, that was a one. different one. Yeah, you know anybody that knows knows Virginia here knows that in the in the summertime you get a lot of beetles, right? And along Mossy Creek, there's a lot of rose bushes, and it seems like the Japanese beetles love to eat those things up. And hey, look anywhere on the East Coast, whether you're you know, fishing a spring creek, fishing, uh, you know, fishing a bigger water, even even floating a bigger river for smallmouth. Beetles are always on the menu, let's say, from, you know, from June all the way through through the first hard frost. So, yeah, I actually I think Rob Stu Stu was with me for that one, too, and was the net guy again. Um, but again, same thing, you know, mossy, a lot of places to hide, right? All those weed beds and you know, some people look at a spring creek like that and be like, well, it's smaller. It's not really that much spot, you know, that many places to fish, not many places where I'd really want to make a cast. But, you know, each one of those weed beds creates an opportunity, right? So um, what I love about that beetle is uh, it just makes a nice splat. It's something I'm sure that somebody else tied it before me, but it works and it's simple and easy to tie. Um, and I remember coming around a corner and and splatting that thing down. And I saw the fish rise, but I didn't, I didn't really know how big the fish was. I, I thought it was, a, you know, I knew it was a nice fish, but I didn't know it was as big as it was. And set the hook and saw this thing kind of start rolling right next to the weed bed. And I, I think I yelled at Stu pretty quickly to, to get up there and bring the net. <laughs> and, uh, and that was another fish. I mean, some of those, you know, Spring Creek fish anywhere are some of the prettiest, right? I don't know if it's, you know, some of the, uh, you know, just the water, you know, the characteristics of the water that they're in, right, with, bunch of nutrients coming off limestone i mean who knows the minerals so on and so forth that are in there that their food eats and then thereby they eat you know some of those spring creek fish are just gorgeous and just another another specimen of a of a brown trout for sure was there a name to that pattern <laughs> i don't know would you like to name it i don't think it has one right now what's your dog's name we can name it after him lincoln 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 the fishing dog we, yeah lincoln, we'll figure it out yeah, we can out for that beetle. Yeah, whatever it is, it works, and it's easy to tie, which are the two things I look for in a in a fly. <laughs> you also caught a snakehead in the canal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You so you kind before... of accomplished more in the couple of years you've lived here. It's like I've lived here my whole life. I've never been in the Washington Monument. Kind of one of those things. You fished everything and have been very successful in what you've done in a limited amount of time. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think I've been lucky, Rob. I've had a lot of, you know, I mean, I've had a lot of people show me a lot of stuff. And, and I've always, I, I think, you know, when you look at, you know, what makes somebody a, a successful angler versus somebody that just that just isn't, I think it's a lot of it really just boils down to genuine curiosity. For better or for worse, I'm a curious guy. I always have been. I think I think I always will be. And at times that uh, probably drives my buddies, and I know it drives my wife up up a wall. Um, when my, you know, whenever whenever someone tells me something, my my next question is is always always going to start with a why. But uh, but yeah, I think you know when you're curious and you've been lucky. You know, I've been very lucky to be exposed to a lot of different types of fishing, um, be it trout, warm water, salt water here in the U S all, you know, from coast to coast and, and literally I've been lucky enough to fish around the world and you just see a lot of stuff. And when you, you know, when you're just able to, to go explore something and apply different things that you've learned in other places to, to wherever you are at the moment, uh, eventually you're going to figure out something that works. What are some um, of the exotic locations you go to? I mean, I'm a, I'm a tarpon geek. I love, I love fishing for tarpon. Um, so one of my, one of my very closest friends is a guy who I'm sure you, you, you know, you've seen him on the, on the silver screen, right. Is, is Alejandro Vega Cruz, Mr. Sandfleet. It's, you know, so Holbosch is a place, uh, you know, Holbosch is where he lives. It's, it's right at the tip of the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, used to be really off the grid now has, has become, a a bit better known both for the tarpon fishing and for uh, just just it's a great place to go on a beach vacation in Mexico. You know, it's a place that I try to go every year. I'm hoping that with this, we were supposed to go down there actually the first week of April, but the, obviously with the COVID stuff, that didn't happen. So I'm hoping um, that we'll get to keep the streak alive. I think this will be maybe my 12th or 13th year in a row going down there. But again, like tarpon fishery, really cool. There's a lot of lessons you can learn from fishing for tarpon. 
you know, just how to, how to work a fly and, and how to make a fish eat a fly, right? I mean, everybody thinks that a fish has to be hungry, and, and most of the time you're right, right? You know, but a lot of times with tarpon, you can, you can fish a fly in a certain way and read the fish, and I don't want to say force feed them because you're not, you know, you're not shoving it down their throat, right? But uh, there's a lot of tricks you can do to, uh, to trick, a, trick a fish that doesn't want to eat into eating. And then apply that to something back here, back home, whether it's a smallmouth, you know, a muskie, um, or even a trout when you're streamer fishing, right? Uh, kind of the same idea. So that's one of them. I, that's one that I, you know, near and dear to my heart, maybe not as exotic as it used to be, but certainly one one really cool fishery that I've been really, really lucky to spend a lot of time exploring with, uh, with one of my closest friends. Are there fisheries you have yet to fish? Yeah. Oh, I mean, there's always going to be one, right? I mean, I don't think there's anybody out there, even, even like a Jeff Curry or something like that, that, that hasn't done, uh, done at all. I think there's, there's one in particular that, uh, I would say if I, well, I have a few and I'm now I'm thinking of my bucket list and there's, there's a lot of buckets, <laughs> but one, if I were to highlight one, I've always, I've always wanted to do the taming thing. You know, I, I know, you know, Hey, you're a podcast guy, right? Like, if anybody wants to geek out on Taman, there's another podcast I just started listening to. Can I can I give them a shout out here, Rob? Out. Is that cool? Yeah. So it's uh, I, let me look up the name, but it's a guy named John McMillan who just started this this. It's predominantly around steelhead, and again, with my steelhead background, I'm a steelhead geek. Oh, is he a uh, Northwest steelhead guy? Something? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, his, he his lives Instagram's on the OP. Pretty awesome. Is, oh, it's awesome. If you're looking for a mix of like cool fishing stuff. And just a way to educate yourself, you got to check out his Instagram. And um, let's see, where's his podcast? Here it is. It's the uh, OP Fishing Podcast. Okay. Yeah. So he has an episode. Let me scroll back and find that one. Is that on Barbless? It is on Barbless. Yeah. yeah. Where is it here? Here it is. It was from February seventeenth, episode five. Hucho Taman, aka the Mongolian Dinosaur, with Matt Sloat. And if you don't know what a taman is or you don't know why you'd ever want to go fishing with them, listen to this podcast because this guy caught a taman that was over 100 pounds. Those I don't – full. I mean you need – to match the hatch, you would need a fly the size of a chum salmon. It, well, you know what, what was really cool about that podcast, Rob? The guy – well, literally, he talks about how in some of like the most productive taman rivers in the world, the taman are eating salmon. They're eating salmon, which is wild to think about, right? You've got to read um, uh, what, what was uh, Tucker Malarkey's book about her cousin Guido Rar. He's got okay. some crazy stories in that. Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, like I love, if I were to summarize like what I look for in fly fishing, it's it's really simple for me. Like I want to see wild fish doing wild things. And I can't imagine something more wild than, than fishing a, you know, a fly as big as your forearm for the, the world's largest salmonid, right? Like in, in China or Mongolia or Russia, <laughs> miles, miles and miles and miles away from anything, right? That, uh, doesn't get more wild than that. And I imagine that's where you'd see a pretty, pretty ancient, pretty wild fish doing a, doing a pretty wild thing, like trying to kill a big fly that, uh, is as big as most fish you catch here in North America. Yeah, absolutely. So if I were to pick one, that would probably be the one, right. um, but there's a bunch of them. I've got a lot of fishing left in me. A lot more to do. I'm not done yet. Any fishing questions I forgot to ask before I go into some random questions? Or I don't know. Save it for another one. We could do a live one. Yeah, we, I think we got to do a live one, right? I mean, we're all uh, we're all uh, we're all in the same boat with this COVID thing, right? You know, can't wait to be back with my buddies. You know, um, hey, we all we all have to have to do what's smart in in the light of everything going on and. But yeah, we'll have to do the we'll have to do another one and, and do it live. Absolutely. All right. Uh, question one: Are you related to anyone famous? Uh, not that I know of. So so pro- I guess that means probably not. All right. If you could be quarantined in a fishing destination, other than where you are right now, where would you like to be? Oh God, that's a great that's a really good question, Rob. Who? I mean. I mentioned Holbosch. I mean, anywhere on the Yucatan sounds pretty nice right now. I'm a big Pacifico and a big Sol guy, so being able to go out and and fish for permit tarpon or bonefish all day, and then and then whack a few uh, whack a few Mexican loggers uh, with some ceviche sounds pretty good, you know. But Wyoming, hey, it's uh, it's May. 
it's May runoff starting runoff's going to be over here and let's call it a month, six weeks or something like that. You know, depends, right? It's going to be a pretty good summer to be in Wyoming, probably a few less people around and uh, no shortage of hungry trout. So I think that's a trick question, Rob, because there's no right answer. There's no right answer to that. What do you carry your gear in when you're fishing and what will we find in there? Oh, you, when we do it live, Rob, we'll have to have a few of my buddies come and you'll have to ask them questions about Brett's gear. Um, you'll get some pretty funny answers. I will say what I've been doing a lot lately. So I have, um, I have a few different rafts. I have a, both a fly craft and a Smith fly raft. And what I've been, you know, doing a lot lately is floating for smallmouth. So floating a lot of the rivers here and, you know, all over Virginia and, and what I, what I've been loving, one of my favorite pieces of gear right now is the Yeti loadout box. It's a super fancy tackle box. And I've got everything in there from extra sunglasses to beef jerky to a bunch of different, you know, every <laughs> more flies than you'd ever need, really. I'm trying to think what probably the weirdest thing I have in there is. Maybe camouflage duct tape because, you know, you're going to need the duct tape at some point. And just don't put it down and lose it. it. Well, if it's camouflage, it just makes it 10 times cooler. Yeah. automatically. So yeah, that Le- Yeti loadout box is pretty cool. For those of you who don't know what it is, once, uh, once this whole, you know, once all the restrictions are lifted, go into district angling and check them out. Richie has a few of them in there and they're awesome. Um, one, definitely one of my favorite pieces of gear and love it in the boat. Awesome. If you only had one style of pizza with one topping for the rest of your life, what would you choose? Ooh, golly. That's another tough one. So, we uh, we have an uni pizza oven, Rob. I don't know if you've ever heard of those things, but uni they're they're awesome. You got to check them out. So there's a funny story behind that. So I uh, my wife's birthday is in January, just a couple, well, about a week and a half before mine. And my <laughs> I don't always take direction well. That'll that'll come as a shock to the people that uh, that know me really well. That I'm I'm a little bit of an independent thinker and kind of like to do things my way. So. My wife has learned that if she wants things that, if she wants to get things that she actually wants for, for, you know, her birthday or for Christmas or whatever, she needs to be very specific with me about what those items are. So she's created a Pinterest, Rob, where, where I can go at any time and see what, uh, what's on my wife's wish list. That's pretty cool. My wife's so, easy to shop for, gin. There you go. There you go. There you, that, gin. That's perfect. Well, let's just say that getting, you know, bringing this back to pizza. So my wife, you know, had a list of things that she wanted, uh, which I did not go off of. And I got her this pizza oven instead. And and she was really mad at me until um, what I said we would do with it. So we had a pizza party and again, pre-COVID here, but for her birthday. And we used this pizza oven, made a whole bunch of pizzas. And they were phenomenal. Bring a topping. So everybody did bring a topping, and I know you asked for just one, but but what we've what we've been really loving is, I don't know what you'd call. I mean, it's I'm it's, it's, it's almost like a because I have more arugula and I know what to do with. You can that's her. Some. So I'll say this: that is her favorite topping, for sure. She loves arugula, but what we've been making is a lot of like we've got basil going in the garden right now. So fresh basil, prosciutto, and ricotta cheese. Do you ever make your own ricotta? I have not. It is that you take a gallon of milk, uh huh. You bring it to a boil, okay. You add salt, lemon juice, stir it for a couple of minutes, and then just strain it through cheesecloth, and you've got fresh ricotta. Really? It is probably it's as easy as making tea. Huh? We've I been you know on more salt though. Okay, we've been you know we've been hitting up you know through quarantine when we when we run low we go and hit up the Italian store. I'm sure that's a favorite of yours. They have uh, this bolognese salt. It's rosemary, uh-huh. thyme, and sage mixed in with the sea salt. That goes on everything. It's okay up there with our Montana Max and our chicken salt. Okay, all right, we're definitely gonna have to look into that. That sounds that sounds right up our alley. I had a hankering for their Genoa on a soft roll, but after going to Charlottesville last week to Bell and having their Italian sandwich, whew, that's, uh, that's a hard one to beat. Yeah, pretty solid, huh? It's worth the drive if you're going to Charlottesville. Okay. Well, I think my okay. wife bought three dozen bagels. Yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, their donuts are what donuts aspire to be. And then my, really? well, my daughter left okay. my Broden 
wooden landing net at Rose River Farm. <laughs> we threw it back down this weekend. Well, I'm sure that's not going far, right? No. Well, it turns out my buddy, his in-laws live on the, the next exit down on the other side of 29 from Rose River Farm. And I was going to text them like, hey, we're driving by your in-laws' house. There's just farm. All they do is hunt and fish. It's a country song where they live. <laughs> that's awesome. And then on the that's way awesome. back, three hours later, I get a text. Hey, we've been at the farm for five weeks now quarantining because we don't want to be in Texas. I was like, dude, I would have stopped by. Yeah, All yeah, they do absolutely. Is there's two buildings, a pond, and then just four-wheel trails where they just have deer stands and they're getting ready for turkeys. That's a pretty yeah. good place to be quarantined. Yeah, it is. I mean, again, like the opportunities that we have around here to, to do stuff outside. I mean, I'm a big, I'm an avid waterfowler too. We, we just have a, we're lucky. We got all, we have a lot of stuff around here. So, and, and thankfully, you know, at least here in Virginia, a lot of that, um, a lot of those outdoor activities are still, you know, still something that we can do. Right. And, you know, even, even during all this, uh, all this madness that is 2020. So we're hoping to go down this Friday and hang out for a little bit distance, happy hour, and then go get the net. But I, their farm pond, I was using a fresh piece of 10-pound tippet with my black hula girl, and I caught something that broke my line. I don't know. Yeah. What, it was violent, and it was quick, and it sounded like a bowling ball was dropped in the water, and then it was over. You know, it's it's always fun when that happens. I had something just, just you know, Rob, you know, we've had a lot of high water around here lately. So um, this weekend, we were lucky and found, found a pretty cool smallmouth fishery. But the weekend before, you know, we were fishing still water. I'm fishing a big reservoir um, around here, and it's always fun. And I just think it always makes for a cool story, right, when you get bit off and you don't know what it was. So I was fishing this pattern that um, I first saw it through one of my buddies. He came up with it. It's it's really interesting. It's almost like a wiggle minnow on steroids, and it fishes like a rapala. It's like a rapala on a fly rod. It wiggles when you strip. Really fishy pattern. And anyways, I just started tying some, and was just kind of chucking it around and seeing how it fished and you know we were hoping to catch largemouth there's a bunch of bass in this reservoir and made a cast this drop off and and this the, the head on these things it's a lot of foam right like if you stop stripping the thing floats to the surface and floats up in a hurry but anyways i'm stripping and i'm kind of just not paying attention right the flies right next to the boat maybe 10 feet away all of a sudden there's a giant splash I see, I don't know what it was, it, maybe maybe a bowfin, maybe a big pickerel, I don't know. But I set the hook, and, and literally my 20-pound fluoro is just sheared off instantly. Wow. And and I'm like, huh, you know, that was pretty cool. And sure enough, about, about 10 seconds later, about 25 feet away, the minnow just floats right up to the surface. Cool. <laughs> yeah. We still don't know, you know, obviously no idea what it was, but hey, getting bit off is always cool. Yeah. Um, right, next question. Yeah. Uh, your toilet paper do you keep it over or under i'm an over guy yeah. for sure Excellent. over yeah you know when you when it goes under i just don't need that stuff touching anything except for what it needs to mm-hmm. you know i don't i don't need it rubbing up against the wall or you know anything like that so i'm, I'm an over guy all right uh when is it okay to pose with a rod over the shoulders uh i would say i know i know your answer here, robin your answer would be never but i would say when you have a big two-handed rod that you can just throw up there in a you know big fat reel that just sits right there on your shoulder, it's just easy, right? Sure. You take your picture, you let your fish go, you reach over your shoulder, you grab your rod, and you're swinging again before you even know what happened. Maybe I need to fish my 14-foot nine weight more often. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. All right. Do you ever have recurring fishing dreams? Ooh, I <laughs> I have a lot of recurring real-life fishing dreams, but I no, I wouldn't say that I do. I wouldn't say that I do. Or at least not that I remember anyway. Do you have a fishing book you'd recommend? Oh, I mean, I think, and I'm probably going to butcher his last name. I've heard a lot of people say it a million different ways, but anything by John Gierach is amazing, right? And I think, you know, hey, like, I'm I'm as guilty as anybody about focusing on big fish and just the fishing and yada, 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 right? I mean, I'm, I'm curious, and I'm usually when it comes to angling, I'm, as motivated as anybody and at times probably a little too motivated. You know, I think that a lot of his, uh, a lot of his writing really brings it back home. It's pretty cool that we're alive during his lifetime. Like we're old men sitting around the fire. Be like, yeah. Remember, remember that all, you know, people are like, Oh yeah. The John Guy. Like I remember when he had books coming out. 
Yeah, I mean, one of my my one of my favorite quotes, Rob. Like it or not, we all live how we fish, and vice versa. For some of us, that's a blessing, and for others, it's a curse. And hey, no truer words have ever been written or spoken, for that matter. He um, said, "Bagpipes they make you want to cry or fight." Yeah, <laughs> I can. Uh, you know, but also entertaining. I think he's got a new book coming out too. I hope. Uh, I mean, well, I hope quarantine ends as soon as it can. That'll be very high on my reading list when it does come out. Strangest thing you found while fishing. I'm sure along Ohio Tribs, something weird probably came up once or twice. Oh, let's see. God, I can think of, I can, th- I can think off the top of my head some things that other people have found that are, that are pretty weird. How about a boa constrictor? Yeah, that's on the about... chagrin. Have Have you seen that picture? Yeah, Maybe somebody I found have. a that's... a dead boa constrictor in the middle of winter on the chagrin. It was like fourteen feet. Yeah, it was huge. I don't know. If it was ten feet long or fourteen feet long. Yeah, that was that was pretty wild. That was Maybe that I was heard that story. I would not have. Re- I would remember it if it was that big. Yeah, no, it was big. I'll have to find that picture and send it to you. I I didn't find it. One of my buddy's buddies found it, but that's pretty weird. I've never found a dead body, but I know a spot I fish a lot. Somebody else did from somebody that jumped off a bridge, oh. and they're yeah, not 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 cool. Not my wife's not boss was very sad by a jumper under Key Bridge once when he was in a boat. That's yeah, yeah fish the guy out. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, it's sad. Have um, you seen the pictures of the guys jumping off of it a couple of years ago in the summer? No, I haven't. They're sneakers and they climb the rail and they jump in the Potomac from Key Bridge. Well, I guess if they, I don't know what I don't know what to think about that. There's probably a whole bunch of mono and treble hooks down there, so I wouldn't do it. <laughs> I would not do that. But God, I'm trying to think back to the weirdest thing I've found. I have a pretty funny story about. <laughs> Don't want to call out Dan on the podcast, but it involves Dan Probanic, a bad knot, and a really good customer, and finding uh, losing a, an entire fly line and then finding it again. Me retying the fly line to his backing and landing the fish. That was a pretty cool find. It's, yeah, I haven't found anything super weird. I'm kind of happy about that. Found a bunch of like, I don't know, I'm thinking like stray cats and dogs. I mean, every piece of tackle you could ever imagine. You got to be careful with the cats because I was on Mossy once. I was like, hey, little kitty cat. And it put his head up, and it wasn't a black cat. There was a big white spot on his forehead, and it was a skunk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's not good. Oh, That's not good. Smelled, I didn't get sprayed, but I kind of got a warning in the air. And I just want to dry heave thinking about that now. Ugh. In the in the live the live podcast, Rob, we'll have to tell the uh, the skunk in Wyoming story. Indeed. I'll make it yeah, up. yeah, that'll be a funny one. That'll be a good one. What if in your uh, Yeti box, if you forgot to bring, would totally screw you for the day? Oh, I mean, so I'm a <laughs> I I make my own lanyards out of shoelaces, um, and on my lanyards you will always find. My nippers, my pair of Able nippers, which I love, and and my just my Hemos. If that, if I'm missing that, and I open up my box and I show up on the river and I don't have those two things, I will just, I won't be happy. I would say that would drive me nuts. I mean, granted, every it's pretty obvious, right? I mean, the tools you probably use the most, and I I probably have a backup pair buried in there somewhere. But if that thing isn't sitting right at the top in the little tray, right when I open it. It's like, oh my god, you got to be kidding me! So I would say that that right. that combo. Other than a, a boa constrictor and tying someone's line back on and catching a fish, what what story did you have to be there to believe? As the final question of quarantine podcast episode. Well, okay, I've got a I've got one for you, and it and it does not end in success. But I think that a lot of times those are the, those are the best kinds. So I love, you know, I, I know we talked about about tarpon, and I love fishing for those things. But, you know, right up there for me with tarpon are permit, right? And I know everybody talks about, everybody wants to catch a permit. They're hard to catch. It's no secret. We could go into that. We could spend a whole hour on that another time. One of my most memorable permit experiences was actually in Holbosch. So not very well known as a permit fishery. There's not a lot of them there. Um, but there's a few spots that at certain times you can really find them. So it was, 
And actually, Rob, now, I, now that I'm thinking about it, I got two different stories from the same day. We'll have to tell them both right now. So it was me and Sandfly, just the two of us fishing together. And what we were doing is taking turns, you know, pulling across this flat. And it was super windy. I don't know, maybe 25, 30 mile an hour breeze, you know, making it really hard to see the fish, almost impossible. I mean, basically, you'd, you'd be looking for their wakes because you sure as heck weren't just going to see them. You'd be looking for either wakes or tails and then just kind of doing the best you could with what you saw. So I was driving the boat, Sandfleet fishes out of Pangas, get up to the front of the flat, or I should say the upwind side of the flat. I cut the motor. You know, they're pulling off of uh, off a of Yeti cooler, so I throw the cooler up there. And before I even get up, I look out of the corner of my eye, and we, it was kind of getting later in the day, and we didn't go all the way up to the very, very beginning of the flat. And I look up, and I see three permit tails. And they're just, they're doing the they're tailing, you know, they're just going back and forth, they're grubbing in the mud, you know, eating whatever they're eating, a shrimp or crab or who knows what. And sand fleas on the bow. And I was like, hey, I'm sorry, man, we, we cut it a little short. And I mean, that's a, you know, it's a 95 foot cast quartering into, you know, like I said, a 25, 30 mile an hour breeze, right? It's, that's not a breeze that's blowing and that's blowing really hard. I know, <laughs> I know there's a lot of folks out there that think they can cast. Well, we'll try casting in that and then, and then tell me how it goes. And so I look up at Sandfly, and I, again, I felt bad because I, I cut the motor early, and we are where we are, and he doesn't really have a shot at these things, and they're, you know, they're tailing. They're fe- friggin' feeding right, you know, right there. Sandfly spins the drag knob on the reel and brings it down to nothing, pulls hard like three times and dumps the entire fly line on the deck, makes, I don't know if it was a single false cast or two false casts, but backhands this laser that was about a foot off the water the entire way and lands the fly without a splash, like two feet in front of the first fish. And what was amazing, Rob, is, you know, already hard enough to believe because I, you, you've never seen a cast like this. I've, I've never seen a cast like this. All three permit get on the fly immediately. And they're on it, they're trying to eat it, and then they spook each other. <laughs> and the, they blow up and, and swim away. But again, the best, the best cast I've ever seen you know, one of my one of my close friends. Um, really cool experience. Now, part two, and I don't remember if this was before or after, but a similar situation. Like it was blowing so hard, there was no way you were pulling the panga into the wind. So if you saw something upwind of you, you really only had one option, and that was to to throw the anchor and, and try to walk. And and the flats in Holbosch are really soft. Um, not a lot of hard sand. You know, Bahamas type flats. There, it's a lot of mud. And we saw a big school of permit up above us, upwind of us, and we weren't pulling back in, and they were too far to even think about casting. So we we anchored the boat. We both jumped out, and, you know, poor Sandfly. <laughs> you know, the mud's up to, like, probably up to his, the tops of his thighs, right? I mean, it's up there. And for me, it's, like, you know, above my knees, it's thick. And we trudged through it, kind of trying just to get closer and closer to these fish to get a shot. Finally, these fish kind of disappear, and we're like, oh, you got to be kidding me. We just walked 100 yards in the mud after these things. And as we're thinking that, all around us, Rob, a school of probably 100 permit, they came out of nowhere. I literally could have poked every single one of them in the eye with a fly rod. Wow. And they're just swimming in a circle around us, all all around us. And I'm just dabbling the crab. Are they going to eat you? <laughs> like revenge of the permit? I don't know what they were going to do, but, but I've never... You know, everybody thinks of permit as these super wary, hard to catch things, and they are, right? So you don't think that that you'd have literally a hundred of them within twenty feet of you, but we did. And of course, they, you know, even dabbling the crab, a crab in front of every single one of them, not a single one of them would eat. But again, just to be kind of surrounded by those by a fish that's so so wild, so skittish, so smart. I wish. <laughs> You know, drones had probably, I guess that was maybe, I don't know, eight years ago, something like that, six years ago. I don't know. Drones weren't big then, but I can only imagine what a drone shot would have looked like with, with Sandfly and I standing next to each other and all those permit within, you know, literally a rod, a rod's length or two, right? Uh, just a really, really cool thing. And of course, because they're permit, none of them ate. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, I would say that that's probably part two from that same day that you had to be there. 
Fantastic. Yeah, I had to be there. All right. Well, Brett, thank yeah. you for your time this evening. Any plans yeah, you for the bet. Rest of your night? No, I no, not really. I think the wife is uh, is getting dinner going. But um, one thing, Rob, I'd like to say just to just to leave it. Um, you know, I know, Rob, you've you've worked in and around the fly fishing industry and a lot of the local fly shops here in DC for a long time. And, you know, you mentioned Dan, we talked about Richie over at district angling. I know you had art on just the other day with, uh, you know, with our, you know, as a manager of one of our local Orvis stores. And, and one thing I'd like to say, I've, I've been, or been in and around the fly fishing industry for a long time. Um, and you know, it's not easy to be in that industry period. And it's, and it's especially not easy right now. So, so for those of you out here in the D.C. area, I know I think a lot of the Orvis stores are still closed, but when they're open, go back in. You know, district angling still open for, uh, you know, for mail orders and, pickup. and for curbside pickup. Go go, give Richie a call, get some tying stuff, spin up those bugs so you're ready to go when uh, when things get better. Again, a lot of a lot of fly shops in and around the D.C. area. And, you know, hey, no matter where you are, I'm sure there's one of them. It's it's never been more important if you if you have the means to uh, to support those guys, they need it. Times are always tough in the fly fishing industry; they're just tougher now. So, uh, for all your listeners out there, if if you can support them and support them all, right on, very cool. Well, yeah. thank you again for your time, and we'll do this hopefully soon in person, and we get your wife some of our arugula. Give her like yeah. three pounds of it if she wants. <laughs> oh, she'll she'll it'll be gone in two days in our house, Rob. Oh my God. We have so much arugula right now. She, She's an arugula fiend, yeah. so. Um, but yeah, no. Thanks for having me, and can't wait. Uh, can't wait to do the live one. Right on, dude. Thanks so much. Yeah, you bet. Take care, Rob. All right, I'm glad we finally got you on. Yeah, you bet. Right, bye. Bye bye. Thank you for joining us for the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. For more information or to contact Rob, please go to www.robsnowwhite.com. This podcast is brought to you by Freestone Productions at freestoneproductions.com.